If you've been around internet leftist circles for any amount of time, you've probably seen memes that mention Trot to Neocon Pipeline, or that neoconservatism came out of Trotskyism. This, I think most people who repeat this have never really looked into it and are really just repeating memes they've heard. The typical claim is some Trotskyists split off and became conservatives, but that they kept their Trotskyist opinions, like permanent revolution, which people think means invading other countries to spread the revolution. And so therefore, these Trots turned conservative who created neoconservatism were for invading countries to spread conservatism and liberal democracy, and therefore Trots are responsible for the Iraq War, or the Gulf War, or whatever. These myths really came out of the 1980s, where paleocons and neocons were engaged in debates and polemics. And this myth was created by paleocons to slander the neocons, but it has been spread a lot further than just paleocons. Now, for this video, I'm basically pulling all of this from William F. King's Neoconservatives and Trotskyism, published in the American Communist History, which is a peer-reviewed journal focused on the historical impact of communism in the United States. If you want a more in-depth breakdown, please go read his article. So, let's first talk about the claims. And I did some digging on the internet to find examples of what some of the most modern claims about this are, so I can target those. The most common I found something was along the lines of, well, former Trotskyists founded neoconservatism. So that's the main claim I'm going to be dealing with. Uh, most of these were taken from Reddit. <laughs> Uh, this one was from a highly upvoted post in r slash communism 101. The route from Trotskyism and neoconservatism was mostly that of Jewish New York intellectuals. And I managed to lose track of where I found this one. The entire neocon movement was founded by former Trots. And this doesn't extend just to Reddit. This is from the New York Times in 1998. Nathan Glazer has had more second thoughts in his lifetime than most people have had thoughts. He is the most modest of the brilliant Jewish boys who attended City College 60 years ago and later came to be known collectively as the New York Intellectuals. The City College crowd helped chart post-war America's ideological frontier. Like Nevis class yards, Glazer journey had stead steadily rightward for decades, from Trotskyist to Social Democrat to neoconservatism. So first, it is probably best to establish a bit of history of what even is neoconservatism. And this is hard, as it's not really a self-description of a group of people, but something that's applied to various figures. After spending a few days reading about it, there seems to be a lot of inconsistency. The exact start date does not even seem to be agreed on. This actually makes it sort of a hard theory to debunk, because people can sort of arbitrarily who include who is a neocon, but... I'll first cover what I think the best way of defining the group is, and then deal with some alternatives. They hated the new left and counterculture, and the Vietnam protests. They didn't think the market was moral, and humans had to enforce that, and generally were critical of unrestrained capitalism. Not that they didn't love capitalism, just they would take issues with the idea of people like Hayek, and really wouldn't agree with somebody who has more libertarian views. They felt the government had a role to play. They didn't reject the New Deal, or even some parts of the Great Society, and this is the main aspect of what made this group different. Nathan Glazer, who is considered one of the first neoconservatives, talked about the group like this. All of us had voted for Lyndon Johnson in 1964, Hubert Humphrey in 1968, and continued to vote for Democratic presidential candidates all the way to the present. Had we not defended the major social programs, from Social Security to Medicare, there would have been no need for the neo before conservatism. We should also talk about where exactly did these people originate from. Well, they were built up of really two groups. A section of the New York intellectuals, this would be Irving Kristol and Nathan Glazer, who I might add didn't like the label of neocon, who were typically the neocons from a more leftist background. But you also had hawkish Democrats like Elliot Abrams and Daniel Moynihan. But even that distinction is not that useful because while some parts of who formed neoconservatism were part of the New York intellectuals, and don't conflate the two groups. People often do. Some neocons were New York intellectuals, but not all became neocons. This group did have a lot of Marxist influence for many of their time at the City College of New York. And this was during the 1930s. They had become liberals for the most part before and during World War II. So fundamentally, the neocons were Cold War liberals and had been for decades before becoming the neoconservatism. So alongside these neoconservatives, they started to fight with what has been termed paleoconservatives, basically more old-fashioned conservatives. They were opposed to immigration, and you might say, well, aren't all conservatives anti-immigrant? But you should remember the last president to do full amnesty for undocumented immigrants was Ronald Reagan. Also, this is 
relative and in comparison to each other. They were more anti-immigrant than some other conservatives at the time. Where neocons often were still for New Deal and some Great Society programs, the paleocons remained opposed to the New Deal and the Great Society. Where neocons often claimed to support civil, the civil rights movement in part, though they really argued that many aspects of it went too far, the paleocons full-out rejected it. Again, it's all relative we're talking here. Certainly they weren't exactly progressive, but compared to other conservatives, they were more for these things. Another big difference is paleocons tended to be more isolationist, where neoconservatives, though this can't be universal and members associated with the neocons, did oppose the Gulf War at times. Paleocons often argued against the Iraq War. For example, Samuel T. Francis in 2003 described the point of the war. The point is to wipe out Israel's enemies. And describing the neocons, he said, of course the Likudniks don't care about American casualties very much. Charges that the neocons aren't loyal to America and only loyal to Israel are pretty common amongst paleocons. He even calls them Likudniks. You can find a lot of this stuff and... You really shouldn't be shocked that paleocons are often open white nationalists. They reject that neocons are even American and say that they are loyal to Israel, which I would hope we all recognize as ridiculous and bigoted. The paleocons often think the U.S. has no logical reason for supporting Israel and that the fact that the U.S. government does is some kind of conspiracy. I hope anyone would see how ridiculous this is. The American ruling class backs Israel because it's in their interests in the region. It has nothing to do with Israel being Jewish and being supported by some kind of Jewish cabal controlling the U.S., just in the same way there's not an Arab cabal controlling the White House to make the U.S. support Saudi Arabia. This is important to keep in mind, that the Paleocons often go down the road of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, and this really ties into the whole trot neocon thing, which I'll get to, into more in a minute. As noted by William F. King in 1988, the paleocon historian Paul Gottfried authored The Conservative Movement, which was supposed to be a history of the conservative movement with a focus on the neocon and paleocon divide. And there is zero mention of some Trotskyist connection in the work. However, in the 90s, when he wrote a revised edition, suddenly he inserted all this Trotskyist connection. According to King, the form of this idea originated after the Gulf War, though there is some indication of it prior to the Gulf War. In a 1986 debate, Stefan Tonsor complained to former Marxists that had Stalin not killed Trotsky, he would be working for the Hoover Institute. But this was more of a claim or a joke made at a debate than some more academic histories of neocons produced by the paleocon movement. According to the King article, the myth was created in the form that we know today that Neocon conservatism came out of Trotsky's roots, was written for the Washington Report on Middle Eastern Affairs, and was written by Leo Hader of the Cato Institute. In this, he argues the major figures in the neocon movement were former Trots who went to poor man's Harvard, CCNY, naming Irving Crystal, Norman Pader Paderitz, Midge Dechter, Nathan Glazer, Daniel Bell, and Ben Wattenberg. However, as King points out, there are some really huge issues with this theory. Ben Wattenberg was four years old when Irving Kristol went to CCNY, and Wattenberg never even attended CCNY. Wattenberg never was even a leftist, let alone a trot. He was a capitalist his whole life. Norman Paderitz and Midge Dechter also never went to CCNY or have ever been Marxists. Nathan Glazer and Daniel Bell actually did attend CCNY in the 30s, so, you know, at least the article gets, like, one thing right. But not really, because there's more problems. Nathan Glazer was never a Trotskyist. He was a left socialist Zionist, never a Trotskyist. However, even the New York Times called him a Trotskyist in the article I pulled from earlier. I have seen several attempts to tie Trotsky to Zionism, which is really just anti-Semitic nonsense and assuming that he is a Zionist because he's Jewish. On to Daniel Bell. Well, what about Daniel Bell? Well, he was a, a member of the Young People's Socialist League in the early 1930s. And in 1936, the Trotskyist movement in the U.S. decided to implement the French turn in the U.S. and did enter into the Socialist Party with the intention of breaking off young radicals in the party. However, while that was happening in part, in reaction of the Trotskys entering the Socialist Party, the Social Democratic Federation was formed, and Glazer became a member. Then, Nathan Glazer also wrote, 
Trotskyism as a derivative of Leninism is alien to freedom of thought and conscious and must be fought in 1939. So he was immediately hostile to Trotskyism after it entered the party he was in. So that leaves us with just Irving Kristol. And I want to spend some extra time on him specifically, since he is probably your best argument if you're going to tie Trotskyism and neoconservatism together. He actually wrote an autobiographical essay titled Memoirs of a Trotskyist, so hey, that's something. In it, he says, I was a member in good standing of the Young People's Socialist League. This organization was commonly and correctly designated as Trotskyist. However, <laughs> Irving really was not a full member of the... Uh, Young People Socialist League, he was a fellow traveler, and in 1940, he didn't join the Socialist Workers' Party, the Trotskyist Party in the U.S. at the time, but the Workers' Party, led by Max Chapman, which Trotsky described Chapman this way in 1940 in an article titled Petty Bourgeois Moralists in the Proletarian Party. And to read this, I asked Socialist in a Barrel, who is new to creating videos, you should go subscribe to them, and if you like my content, you'll probably like either one of their videos, uh, one titled... One time Russia almost got its own Latin alphabet, and the problems with Soviets and the media. Only the other day, Schachmann referred to himself in the press as a Trotskyist. If this be Trotskyism, then I, at least, am not Trotskyist. With the present ideas of Schachmann, not to mention Burnham, I have nothing in common. I used to collaborate actively with the New International, protesting in letters against Schachmann's frivolous attitude towards theory, and his unprincipled concessions to Burnham, the strutting petty bourgeois pedant. But at the time, both Burnham and Schachtham were kept in check by the party and the international. Today, the pressure of petty bourgeois democracy has unbridled them. And of the Workers' Party, Crystal belonged to the faction of Shermanites, which was a right-wing faction of the party that eventually was thrown out in 1941 because they rejected Marxism. Crystal is also quoted as having said, I was a young Trotskyist for 18 months or so, but even when I was in it, I couldn't quite take it seriously. Now I'm going to quote King's conclusion on Irving. Looking beyond both journalistic reminiscence and polemically motivated exaggerations, a more balanced appraisal of Irving Crystal's Trotskyism that he was involved on the intellectual, energetic margins of the movement, and then briefly passed through the movement itself while maintaining a non-Trotskyist and arguably, given the Shermanites' emphasis on political democracy, a non-Marxist political outlook. As Crystal himself would remark later in years, I've never considered myself to be an ex-Trotskyist in the sense that some people conceive themselves as ex-communists. The experience was never that important to me. By the end of the Second World War, during which Crystal saw service with the U.S. Army in Europe, he was no longer a socialist of any stripe. And King's even more positive on Crystal's Trotskyism than I am. He was in the right wing of a party led by a man Trotsky declared to have nothing in common with his ideas. I would say he never really was a Trotskyist. Another thing to keep in mind when this was, this was 1930s and briefly into the early 1940s. It'd be another 30-ish years before neoconservatism would be founded. I was not even alive 30 years ago. That is a long time if you were in your 20s. Like me, imagine you change political ideologies more than 30 years from now. In 2050, you were part of a movement of a sort of new ideology. It sounds ridiculous to act like your opinions you left behind in 2020 had some great impact on your opinions in 2050 and the 2060s. All right, so let's maybe take a look at a larger list of neocons who could maybe be listed to support this theory. See, the issue most of the people who talk about this theory never actually list names half the times, and when they do is, well, you saw above, only one of the people they listed even flirted with Trotskyism, and only for a moment, decades before the founding of neoconservatism, Jean Kirkpatrick. She was actually a member of the Socialist Party. However, she was in the 1940s, after all the Trotskyists were out of the party. See, Trotskyists were purged over the course of 1937 and 1938. Daniel Moynihan, dude was just always a Democrat. Uh, John Podaritz, born to Norman Podaritz, who was never a Marxist, and he was raised conservative by his parents. Seymour Lipset joined the Young People's Socialist League in high school, which would have been before the Trotsky's entryism. And following that, he ended up as sort of part of the Shermanite faction, who really, as we talked about earlier, weren't Trotskyists. And then he was part of the Socialist Party until 1960, so he never left with the Trotskyists to the SWP, really implying he was never a Trotskyist. Sidney Hook. Sidney Hook was actually a Marxist. He was a Marxist. 
He actually studied at the Marx and Engels Institute in Moscow and was a supporter of the Communist Party and William Z. Foster until 1933. Then he ended up being part of the American Workers' Party, which the early Trotskyist movement merged with, but he never actually joined the Trotskyist parties, and he remained a fellow traveler of the movement until 1939. So he was a Marxist-Leninist longer than he even flirted with Trotskyism. I could probably find more, but the thing is, I would really just be listing a bunch of non-Trotskyists. Really, only Irving and Lipset are the only ones who even touch Trotskyism. There are many numerous others who are never even Trots or even Marxists. Um, even if you count Irving Crystal's wife, who briefly flirted with Trotskyism, that brings you up to, what, three out of how many of this sort of first-generation neoconservatives? So let's talk about another alternative theory that, while maybe neoconservatism was not created by Trots, there was a whole second generation of neocons created from Chapmanism. Now, there's a smidge of truth to this one, as a number of neocons did come out of the Socialist Party, who were in leadership at the time Chapman was in the party. However... Trotsky said that if Chapman is a Trotskyist, then he, being Trotsky, is not one, and this was in 1940. Not only that, his group, when it joined the Socialist Party, was to require that they declare that they no longer follow his quasi-Trotskyist ideology by the time he joined. Also worth bringing up that people might find interesting, a position that he, he came to and came and joined the Socialist Party to advocate for was the idea that they should instead become a group that influenced the Democrats from within, pulling them to the left. You might also recognize the name that was part of Chapman's group, who was for pulling the Dems to the left, was Michael Harrington, who had been Chap in Chapman's group, who would eventually would form the Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee, and eventually the Democratic Socialists of America, alongside Irving Howey and another follower of Chapman. So yeah, a few people associated with Chapman did become neocons, but this was really, after any claim of Trotskyism was really gone, more figures moved to form the DSA than became neocons. The DSA is more in common with Chapman's legacy than the neocons do. So I don't think this really proves any connection given Chapman was an odd person in the Trotskyist movement and was disliked by Trotsky. And when he joined the Socialist Party, he rejected his old ideology as part of the conditions. After that, a few people he had influenced became neocons, but this is really stretching to try and prove any connection to Trotskyism. So another sort of idea behind this theory, I guess, for how neocons was founded is pinning it on James Burnham. The idea that he was an original neocon, not figures like Irving, that it was William F. Buckley's National Review, not the public interest and commentary, that sort of started neoconservatism. First, a little bit of backstory of how Burnham ended up and his position within the Trotskyist movement. And I think it's best to probably attempt to provide a short summary of the Trotskyist movement and how it came about, uh, especially given how much else I've talked about, things like the Workers' Party. I think it would be helpful to talk about how this group came about. So, also a first note on the name of Trotskyism. Historically, Trotskyists were called Bolshevik Leninists. It is what Trotsky called his group. But I use Trotskyist because it's the term most people use know today. So let's start with how the Communist Party came about. The Communist Party originated within the Socialist Party. The left wing of the party had been helped along by the influence of the paper Novi Mir, which both Nikolai Bukharin and Leon Trotsky wrote for. Bukharin advocated for the left wing of the Socialist Party to split. Trotsky advocated more for them to purge the party of opportunist elements. In January of 1917, a meeting was held in the flat of Ludwig Lohr. The meeting goal was to debate if to split or to try and unify the left-wing elements within the Socialist Party. Bukharin, Kolontai, and Trotsky would all be there to debate the question. This meeting, along with Novi Mir on the whole, played a part in Trotsky coming closer to the Bolsheviks. Trotsky's mission apparently won the debate, and from this meeting would come the editorial board of Class Struggle, a journal to advocate for the left wing of the Socialist Party. Within the left wing of the Socialist Party, there was two factions by 1919. On the whole, they wanted to become part of the Third International, but one side favored leaving the Socialist Party right away. The other side, wanting to avoid a premature split, wanted to wait and see if the left could take over the party at the convention, and sought to bring Eugene V. Debs to their side. Two notable names of this faction were John Reed and James P. Cannon. They would fail to convince Debs as he didn't want to take a position on the factional struggle. Eventually parts of this group would break off and other parts were expelled. Eventually they would form the Communist Labor Party, an attempt to influence the Socialist Party. But the Communist Labor Party members were barred. Those that had pushed for an immediate split had formed the Communist Party of America. A typical way these groups were presented as immigrants versus indigenous Americans. I really hate this way of explaining this because, as for one, these people were settlers, not indigenous. And the immigrant group was pretty much just Eastern European immigrants. Asian immigrants avoided both groups as well. As well? 
neither party had a single black delegate at their founding conventions. There was a breakaway of black socialists away from the Socialist Party, such as the African Blood Brotherhood. They didn't want to join with either of their faction, as they felt neither took the issue of black liberation seriously. Both factions pledged support to the October Revolution and the Third International, and both published a newspaper by the name of Communist. This nonsense would go on for some time and would really disorganize U.S. communism and cause a lot of the left wing of the Socialist Party to just drift away. Eventually, the Common Turn had enough of this, and they made John Reed of the CLP and John Anderson of the CPA sign an agreement to merge the parties. And this is how America got a unified Communist Party. American Trotskyism had its roots in a faction of the Communist Party led by James P. Cannon. Within the party at the time, there was roughly the William Z. Foster faction, the J. Lovestone faction, and the Cannon faction. The Lovestone faction took control of the party in 1925 from the Foster Cannon faction. They were able to do this with the support of the Common Turn. There would be various struggles in the party over the issues of language federations and legalization during the whole of the 20s. Within the U.S. The debates uh, in the USSR between Trotsky's left opposition and the stalin bukharin faction were basically unknown. Cannon tried to go to Moscow to gain some support from the common turn from the left Knights. The differences were over the focus with Foster and Cannon favoring basing the party in Chicago and trade union work. Cannon had previously gone to Moscow to get their support in 1922 when the debate was over legalization of the party, as the party had been operating as an underground party with a front party called the Workers' Party. Cannon was a part of the group that wanted to merge the underground party into the legal party and become a fully legal party. The reason many opposed it is many felt only an underground party could be revolutionary, and America would soon have its own October Revolution, and therefore had no purpose for a legal party. Cannon went to Moscow and met with Trotsky, and Trotsky promised to talk to Lenin, and Lenin would support legal legalization. Cannon went to Moscow again in 1928 for the Sixth World Congress of the Common Turn. He was hoping for a repeat of 1922 and to get support for his position. While there, he was placed on a program commission. While there, someone on the Common Turn had accidentally given Trotsky's document, the draft program of the Communist International a Criticism of Fundamentals, to the translator, and it was translated into English and mistakenly given to James B. Cannon and Maurice Spencer. Cannon would smuggle this out of Moscow and plan to advocate for Trotsky, but at the time, there was not a single member of the American Communist Party who was supportive of Trotsky. Cannon would recruit within his allies in the party. However, as the Fosterite faction became more aware of the Cannonite faction's movement towards Trotskyism, they broke up their alliance, and eventually James Cannon would make a public declaration of their 100% support of the Russian opposition. Jay Lovestone, who was the party secretary, would carry out a purge of the Trotskyists. He also had people lead raids into the apartments of Trotskyist leaders in the U.S. Trotskyists were attacked and beaten in their meetings. All these efforts were considered very aggressive, and members who refused to endorse these tactics were often removed from the party. This caused many members to be in Minneapolis to be removed despite not being favorable to Trotsky, which drove them into the arms of the Trotskyists. Of course, this didn't just happen there. The overzealous purging of supposed Trotskyists drew a lot of people into the Trotskyists movement in the U.S. Once removed, the Trotskyists set out to start publishing a newspaper. They did. The militant began publishing in November 1928. They also found some allies who were followers of Bordiga. Eventually, this would result in the formation of the Communist League of America, left opposition of the Communist Party, and they held their conference in Chicago of May of 1928. And it had to be protected by coal miners and IWW members for it to be not attacked by the Communist Party members. The position of the time of the Trotskys was that they were an opposition group within the Communist Party, within the Comintern, fighting for reform within the Comintern and within the Soviet Union. During this time, they run into several issues. One, which was a lot of people joined for the wrong reasons. Not because they were Trotskyists, but they were bitter about being removed from the Communist Party. Cannon described these people as petty bourgeois-minded people who can't stand any discipline. They are also small and very scattered around the country. Cannon called this the dog days. There would be divisions between Cannon and Chapman and factional disputes. If you want to know more about this period, you can look up the dog days of the left opposition by James P. Cannon for his perspective on it as a leader of American Trotskyism. The Dog Days came to an end with the general strike in Minneapolis in 1934. This is really, honestly, one of the most interesting events in American labor history. And I would highly encourage you to check out Teamster Rebellion by Farrell Dobbs. Please pirate it or buy it used. Don't give money to the bastards at Pathfinder. You can also find Cannon's account on Marxist.org, The Great Minneapolis Strikes. This would be the event that would take American Trotskyism forward, brought them into contact with workers and actual labor struggles. However, it would have a major downside as it would make the Trotskyists a major target by FDR's government. 
This is kind of an aside, but the police shot striking workers here, and this launched a major growth in the Teamsters Union in the U.S., and this event's hardly talked about. Minneapolis was not a friendly place to unions or organizing at all, and they managed to pull it off. I think any American socialist needs to read about this event, and the short overview I did here is not giving it justice. While the Tritics were playing a leading role in this strike, another party, the American Workers' Party, were leading a strike in Toledo, Ohio, which, like the Minneapolis one, resulted in the deaths of strikers and the calling in of the National Guard. These two massive strikes both occurred in 1934, and it drove the American Workers' Party and the Communist League of America towards each other. The Trotskyists made a call towards the American Workers' Party for them to unify. The AWP were not Trotskyists, but Cannon and the Trotskyists considered it a political menagerie that had everything from proletarian revolutionaries to reactionary scoundrels and fakers. And this is how James Burnham and Sidney Hook came into the Trotskyist movement. He was a member of the American Workers' Party, and it might sound odd that Trotskyists merged with the non-Trotskyist party, but Trotsky conceived of the Fourth International being made up of all revolutionary Marxists who agreed with the program, not just those that called themselves Bolshevik-Leninists, or as they're known now, Trotskyists. Shortly after the merger which formed the Workers' Party, the Trotskyists looked to apply the French turn, also known as entryism, in the U.S. to further their reach. They became more aware that within the Socialist Party, a new left wing was forming, especially amongst the youth sections. So Ken and others started pushing for entry into the Socialist Party. And I also want to give a short explanation of what entryism is. It is something a lot of people talk about, but very few know much about Trotsky's conception of it, especially given many so-called Trotskyists apply a distorted version of it themselves. The French turn was the entry of the Bolshevik Leninists into the SFIOU, the French section of the Workers International. Now, I could do a, make a video on this going in depth, but to make a basic point, based on the lessons of SFIO entryism and the appeal to revolutionary organizations and groups by Trotsky, one, the goal is not to reform or change a reformist party, two, it is not a long-term tactic. Trotsky described that it might be limited to only an episode, it is to be focused on the youth in an organization, which is often the most radical. Fourth, it is a hostile tactic. The end goal is a split in the destruction of the reformist organization, ideally. Five, it is there to accelerate and assist developing differences, not necessarily create them. So, we can see how American Trotsky is applied to this to the Socialist Party. While it was reformist, there was a much more radical youth wing, so basically the goal was to enter and win the youth wing, in Cannon's words, which are being read by Cyan Lime, another content creator whose channel you should subscribe to. The Socialist Party was destined, in any case, to be torn apart. The only question was how, and along what lines. The question was, would the potentially revolutionary elements of the Centrist Party, the worker activists and rebellious youth, be engulfed by these forces? Or, would they be fused with the caters of Trotskyism and brought over to the road of proletarian revolution? This could be tested only by our entry into the Socialist Party. It was not possible for the Trotskyists to come into contact with these potentially revolutionary elements of the Socialist Party otherwise than by joining the Socialist Party. Eventually, the Trotskyists within the Workers' Party talked the party into joining the Socialist Party. This is how some figures like Sidney Hook ended up in the Socialist Party, pulled along with the Trotskyists when they entered. This would, they would enter in 1936 with the intention of destroying the Socialist Party. Their goal is to secure recruits. This is in line with what entryism is, a hostile tactic. In this, they essentially would succeed. It is a bit more complex, but to keep it short, they would enter in 1936, and by June of 1937, Trotsky was pushing for a split as he had felt their goals had been accomplished. However, he was opposed by Max Chapman James, and James Burnham, and honestly, if it was not for the fact they were purged from the Socialist Party, I think Chapman and Burnham would have stayed and not ended up in the Socialist Workers' Party. But anyway, by April of 1938, the removal of Trotskyists had been complete. Then, with the Socialist Workers' Party being formed earlier in 1938, with much of the Young People's Socialist League joining the SWP, the SWP had doubled the membership of the American Workers' Party had entered the Socialist Party with. This was a great success and really a good example of entryism, and it contributed greatly to the decline of the Socialist Party. Things looked bright, however, about as soon as they left the Socialist Party, a major schism would split the SWP. The cause of the split would be the Russian question. Starting even before the split, figures like James Burnham and Max Chapman moved towards and adopted the bureaucratic collectivist analysis of the Soviet Union, that the USR represented not socialism, not a worker state, degenerated or otherwise, or even capitalism, but was a whole new mode of production. This was in contrast to the position of Trotsky. 
Trotsky considered the Soviet Union a degenerated worker state. This means it was a dictatorship of the proletariat or a worker state that had undergone a degeneration due to its isolation, that many of these actions, much of which were forced onto the state. That this is not because of the bad attentions of any given man, but a historical process that slowly degenerated the leading elements into forming their own caste, but no class over the proletariat. They would inhibit the state from moving forward towards the lower phase of communism, sometimes called socialism. Instead, it was stuck with a capitalistic measure of value, not a socialist mode of production, but not a fully capitalist state. The degeneration comes from the part of the state that regulates bourgeois norms, which exists even under socialism, but an even greater extent while in the transitional epoch. This degeneration would inevitably continue so as long as a bureaucratic caste was in power. Trotsky predicted that unless this caste was overthrown, the state would eventually return to, to capitalism. And it is important to note that this overthrow would only be political in nature and not a social revolution. And from this, it was necessary to advocate for the defense of the USSR, but not a defense of Stalin, but a defense of what progressive elements there remained in the state and against Stalin. And the USSR in war, Trotsky said if Hitler turned his armies against the USSR, remember, Trotsky didn't live to see the invasion of the USSR, so this was speculation on his part. The USSR must be defended as they could not permit Hitler to overthrow Stalin, but that they had to overthrow Stalin, not Hitler, at the next stage once Hitler had been defeated. Trotsky remained against seizures of new territories by the bureaucracy and said they could not take responsibility for Stalin's action in Poland or Finland, and these events showed the need to rip the USSR from the hands of the bureaucracy. This is my attempt to summarize Trotsky's position. If you're looking for a more in-depth look, Revolution Betrayed is a great place to start, as is the USSR in war. Thankfully, both can be found on Marxist.org. These debates over the Russian question would all come to a head to the events of 1939 with the invasion of Poland and Finland. Many became a lot more critical of the USSR and Trotsky's position on it. Some, while not outright rejecting the degenerated worker state theory, many felt the USSR had become imperialist. Trotsky also intensified his already existing dislike of Burnham and attacked him for his rejection of dialectics and historical materialism. During a response, Burnham would even say Trotsky was just a stale rehash of Engels. Trotsky would also invite Chapman to Mexico to have a debate. However, he wouldn't go. All of this would climax in the 1940 convention in April, where Cannon's group, who stuck to the position of Trotsky, Cannon's group got 60% of the support, where the minority group got only 40%. Eventually, Cannon's group would try to force the minority group to accept the decision at this Congress, but began suspending and removing those members from the party. These people left and formed the Workers' Party, the Workers' Party had made up a few different groups. Max Chapman and his bureaucratic collectivism theory that still did advance the idea of conditional defense of the USSR, but you had others who advanced a state capitalist position on the USSR, which under that analysis of it that it was state capitalist would mean that if it went to war with Germany or the US, it'd be similar to World War I with competing capitalist powers at war. The two most prominent members of this group would be C.L.R. James, who was particularly well known for writing a history of the Haitian Revolution titled Black Jacobins, and Raya Dunayevskaya, who at this time wouldn't have been as well known as C.L.R. James, who had published several books like World Revolutions and Black Jacobins. She had been Trotsky's secretary for a while, and she would later become well known for her translation of Marx's early works, as well as her contribution to Marxist humanism and founding the Johnson Forest tendency with C.L.R. James and Grace Lee Boggs. And later, the news and letters committees. The Johnson Forsens, he would split from the Workers' Party because they supported state capitalist theory over bureaucratic collectivization and due to the Workers' Party's lack of interest in black activism. Because they still believed in the importance of the party, they would end up rejoining the Socialist Workers' Party again until the 1950s. If you're interested in her position on this and her disagreement with the Chapmanites on this, Marxist.org has her essay, The Union of Soviet Socialist Republics is a Capitalist Society. Within the Workers' Party, there was also the Shermanites, who are anti-Bolshevik. The leader of the Shermanite faction was Philip Zletznik, who used the name Sherman. This faction considered itself revolutionary anti-Bolshevik and opposed the idea that Marxism should be the doctrine of the Workers' Party. This is the faction that Seymour Lipset and Irving Kristol were a part of, the two neocons we talked about earlier, who were the few to have any kind of contact with Trotskyism, and at most it was being in the anti-Bolshevik, anti-Marxist Shermanite faction of the Workers' Party, which was founded by members kicked out of the Socialist Workers' Party for their anti-USSR position, as well as some for their rejection of historical materialism and dialectics. The Shermanites would leave the Workers' Party as well as being kicked out at the same time of the Workers' Party 
who consider them too anti-Bolshevik. So the offshoot of a Trotskyist party who had a lot of issues with Trotsky and who Trotsky declared members of to not be Trotskyist still found this faction of Sherbanites, which is who of the people who would eventually become neocons, they were too Bolshevik and anti-Marxist and they had to be removed in less than a year. Now, as for that probably too long of a detour, back to Burnham. Burnham would join the social, the Workers' Party and be in it for the most brief of moments. After a few weeks, he left the Workers' Party. According to Chapman, he said he, that he refused to use Trotskyist jargon and he had only started learning Trotskyist ideas when the Trotskyists joined the party with the American Workers' Party. This would mean he only started picking up the, these ideas in 1935 and 1936. So... Burnham was against the idea of formation of the Socialist Workers' Party and really only picked up Trotsky's in 1935 at the very early, earliest to a year or two being against forming a Trotskyist organization. And he rejected dialectics and historical materialism following this. By the time of World War II, he had pretty much flat out rejected Marxism and only ended up being in the Trotskyist moment due to them merging into a party he was a member of. So what, at most, Burnham could have been considered a Trotskyist for three, four years? So assuming that, okay, the idea that Burnham and the National Review created neoconservatism, the typical argument for it is on the basis of their foreign policy, which is not really what defined neoconservatism, it's their domestic policy, as I noted earlier. There's also plenty of contributors to the National Review who weren't ex-leftists at all, and there was plenty who were former MLs. The other argument is that the reason neocons descend from Trotskyism is the idea that neocon foreign policy aims at a global revolution of democratic capitalism, but Burnham's foreign policy was focused on only working in American interests. He was never in favor of spreading democratic revolution. So the argument for Burnham to be the proof of the Trot neocon pipeline is weaker if you consider him to be the starting point of American neocons than if you went with the other people mentioned above who contributed to public interest and commentary. Now onto the theory of inverted permanent revolution. I touched on this already, but a common idea is that neocons wanted to spread democracy by the sword, and Trotsky wanted to spread communism at the tip of a bayonet. Therefore, they are the same. However, Trotsky, his theory, the permanent revolution, don't argue for this. So this argument really just falls down. I also did a video on this already. On this question in regards to Trotsky, you should go watch it. So to summarize, a few of the original neocons briefly flirted with Trotskyism before moving on to being liberals for decades before founding neoconservatism. And really, of them, the extent of their Trotskyism has been greatly exaggerated. As mentioned above, the idea of linking permanent revolution and neoconservatism does not follow because permanent revolution does not mean or advocate revolution worldwide by force or invading. And really, neocons were more than willing to work with undemocratic states as long as it was in the interest of the U.S., Plenty, very few of them were ever crusaders for democracy. Anyway, I hope you found this video educational. Please go watch content these other creators mentioned. As always, you can find my scripts in the description. I'm now uploading them to a website so they're easier to view. You should share this video and subscribe to me on here and Twitter. Also, sorry for the long break. This was not originally my planned next video, but this is the one I finished first and I wanted to get it out.